All right, everyone. So um, we have a good group joining us. So we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, my name is Laura Shapiro. I'm one of the internal medicine and pediatrics chiefs this year. We're very excited to host one of our program alums, Dr. Rose Lee, um, for MedPeds Grand Rounds today. So I'm happy to turn it over to Dr. David Wynn to properly introduce her. Um, Dr. Wynn is one of our current internal medicine and pediatric infectious diseases fellows who's graduating at the end of this year. He's also a current postdoctoral research fellow on the T32 in geographic medicine and infectious diseases at Case, where his research is focused on exploring an expanded role for beta lactams for tuberculosis under the mentorship of Dr. Robert Bonomo. So thank you, Dr. Wynn. Thank you. Laura. Uh, so, uh, although I've only met Rose just a few minutes ago, I imagine there's a lot of, that I can already probably feel that there's in common with, not just being MedPeds, but MedPeds ID. So I'm very excited to hear this talk and very honored to, that I was asked to introduce her. Um, Rose, uh, Dr. Lee is a obtained her MD at Northwestern Feinberg School of Medicine, completed her MedPed residency at UH and Rainbow Babies and Children's. Uh, she is an infectious disease specialist. Uh, she did combined fellowship, as I understand it, uh, just like me, and, and clinical microbiology fellowship, who is working on developing the next generation of point of care molecular diagnostics for global health. She joined uh, Professor Jim Collins' lab at the Weiss Institute of Biologically Inspired Engineering during her combined MedPeds uh, ID and Medical Microbiology Fellowships at Boston Children's Hospital and Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center, where she is currently continues her, con her sorry, her con clinical practice. Um, so um, with that, I take it away, Dr. Lee. Great. Thanks so much for that introduction. Um, yeah, thank you for inviting me and I'm uh, very happy uh, to be uh, talking to you all today. Um, uh, just a little bit of background about myself. Um, I think uh, Nate reached out to me um, having been a recent graduate just to I think also kind of um, talk about like a career paths as well for MedPeds graduates and different things you can do. Um, so, uh, you know, as I uh, mentioned, I did fellowship basically a combined fellowship um, in Boston and um, uh, during my research year, is basically it's a four-year fellowship. Um, the last two years being dedicated to research, I got interested in diagnostics, which um, prompted me to do the medical microbiology fellowship, uh, with the, which they have at uh, BI actually. Um, so I, I actually wasn't even aware of this kind of career path before going into ID fellowship. So you know, just something that you know for you to be aware of that um, you know ID clinicians too. For those of you who are, who are interested in ID, there is a pathway to kind of become a hospital clin micro director as well. Um, which is through either medical microbiology fellowship or there are also um, uh, AB PATH, basically American Board of Pathology fellowships too, that um, ID fellows qualify for. Um, so uh, feel free any of the MedPs or other graduates who are interested in ID to reach out to me at any time if you have any uh, career questions or want to know more about micro um, or anything along those lines. I'm happy to answer any of that. So. Um, Okay, great. So my uh, talk is on novel diagnostics and ID today. And some of these are not so much novel as in they've been probably around for at least five to 10 years, but kind of the transitioning uh, kind of um, direction of the field. Um, I have no financial disclosures or conflicts of interest to declare. Um, so the topics I thought I would cover today um, include, uh, you know, microbial identification, um, some of the agnostic technologies that we have. So in particular, universal PCR and next gen sequencing, and then uh, kind of my favorite topic, but these kind of, you know, rising uh, molecular technologies. Um, so they, talking about things like the isothermal nucleic acid amplification test, and then kind of my research area, which is uh, CRISPR based diagnostics. Um, and, you know, I would be happy if this is interactive. So feel free to put things in the chat and interrupt me at any time. Um, I think Laura and Dave were saying that they would help me if there are questions and things that come up and uh, you want to ask them as we go along here. Um, so, you know, in terms of the, the field of microbiology, you know, we've certainly come a long way. Um, you know, I think micro being kind of micro and ID being one of the longest fields of medicine dating back to 1600s when uh, Van Leeuwen Hook was uh, looking at micros basically under a microscope. Um, and then I think the real revolution though in microbiology came probably in the seventies with molecular testing. So nucleic acid identification. Um, however, I think it's still amazing that, you know, for the longest time and still, you know, um, 
even at places, you, you know, even at BI, basically. Um, the standard practice, basically, is still using the, these techniques that were developed in the late 1800s um, to, you know, early to mid-1900s. So, you know, biochemical identification, as well as, um, you know, gram stains here, uh, invented in the late 1800s by uh, Hans Christian uh, Graham, is still, you know, a major way that we think about infectious disease organisms and how we practice. Um, so, you know, for the longest time, basically, uh, a combination of what the bacteria look like on a plate. So here we have a non-lactose fermenting bacteria on a McConkie agar, if you can recall back to your med school days, basically, um, with a gram stain that shows you a gram negative rod. So a pink kind of longish elongated rod here. And then this here up here is an oxidase test, uh, basically, where you have an oxidase uh, reagent and you dip the colony on and it turns it this uh, dark violet. So, you know, some combination of these biochemical tests, as well as, you know, uh, what the organism looked like on a plate was for the longest time kind of how we did our microbial identification, uh, mostly through these kind of workhorse automated commercial systems. And I just have a few sampling here of, you know, the Vitec, the Sensi Titer, VD Phoenix. Um, and, uh, for example, a BI it remains kind of the standard for how we do ID microbial identification and still remains the standard for antimicrobial systems susceptibility testing. So, you know, testing what antibiotics work and when, at what concentration. Um, however, and I know that uh, CASE has kind of uh, had this technology for a while. Um, you know, what uh, many labs in the United States are transitioning to um, or already have is uh, a multi -talk. Um, and so you probably have heard this word thrown around, but, um, you know, just to give you a little bit more background for those of you who are not um, chemistry enthusiasts, um, MALDI-TOF stands for Matrix Assisted Laser Desorption, Ionization, Time of Flight, Mass Spec, basically, so a mouthful. Um, but basically, you know, in the simplest of terms, what it's really doing um, is it's detecting proteins in a cell on a cellular level um, that comprise basically a specific signature for uh, different species of organisms and that's compared to a database of known organisms. Um, so what happens basically is you have your uh, bacteria that's growing on a plate, you take a colony um, and then onto this metal, uh, or basically you apply this matrix to your uh, colony and then apply it to this metal plate. Uh, the purpose of the matrix basically is to protonate the analytes within your sample um, and then uh, give it basically an ionization charge. Um, so that's this matrix assisted part. The laser desorption part um, entails basically you use a laser uh, and you blast at this amount of bacteria that's smeared um, on your little uh, sample uh, here, on your sample site basically. Uh, and it uh, basically ionizes the entire sample, so fragments it. And then now there's a mass and ionized sample or analytes basically that goes through at a specific speed through an electrical field. Um, and the mass basically and ionization determine basically how fast it reaches this reader at the other side. So here's your laser and here's the reader. Um, so that's this is the time of flight part. So ultimately, you know, for those of you who are familiar with mass spec, it gives you one of these graphs with various different peaks that correspond to different signatures relating to the kind of uh, mass to charge ratio of each of the analytes that was just blasted and uh, fragmented from this uh, bacterial sample. That then is compared to a database and identifies your microbe. Um, the reason why MALDI-TOF is more popular these days is because there's a faster turnaround time. Um, and in particular, it's best at identifying less common pathogens. Um, you can imagine that for more um, organisms that maybe have more difficult uh, biochemical tests to distinguish from each other, the former like automated commercial systems um, made it more difficult to kind of give a, a good ID on an organism and potentially it would have to be sent to a reference lab like Mayo or AREP or something like that, adding um, time basically to, to actually answer. Um, so the faster turnaround time certainly has justified some cost savings for the MALDI-TOF and remains one of the reasons why it's now becoming the standard of care in most micro laboratories. Um, however, as I mentioned, a lot of the focus of this talk is going to also be on kind of nucleic acid technology. Um, and so, 
you know, you can imagine that another way that we can ID organisms is actually uh, by sequencing a gene. Um, in particular, the gene that is chosen uh, to sequence um, for what we call universal PCR. So um, when we're sequencing basically a gene to identify uh, which organism it is, is uh, the 16S ribosomal RNA gene for uh, prokaryotes, basically. So it's kind of a housekeeping gene that's conserved. And how this basically works is that this uh, gene in particular has uh, conserved areas, which are depicted here in blue, um, as well as these hypervariable regions, which is uh, depicted here in red, so the V1 through V9. Um, and so, you know, different platforms or companies that you send it to um, will kind of uh, use different primers basically to uh, to basically sequence different hypervariable regions. And those hypervariable regions, which are um, organism specific basically, will then also be compared to a giant bioinformatic database um, that then gives you the bacterial ID. Um, so basically this is leveraging the fact that you have these very nice conserved regions in all types of bacteria that are interspersed with these hypervariable regions that are species specific. Um, I won't go too much into universal PCR utilization, um, but, you know, I, I should mention that even though this technology has been around for a long time, um, you know, the 16S, um, um, you know, basically sequencing became popular in the 90s, particularly for research purposes, and then um, started to become into clinical use, uh, certainly within the last decade. Um, and, you know, there is controversy on when it should be used really in infectious disease. Um, what's the utility of it? You know, there are certain clinical scenarios. You can imagine patients that have been on antibiotics for a long time, maybe pre-treated blood cultures or other, you know, uh, patients where they have pre-treated uh, samples for a long time for which universal PCR might be, um, you know, very helpful because you could still potentially detect uh, dead, uh, you know, um, bacteria or at least the, the nucleic acid of uh, small amounts of bacteria that remain um, if the patient is on broad spectrum antibiotics in the absence of actually bacterial culture growth. Um, however, you know, I, I just do caveat that with there's a, still a lot of kind of um, controversy on how useful this test is and if it's really worth the cost, um, basically, because this is almost always a send out test that's sent to a reference laboratory, something like University of Washington or something like that. Um, so that's universal PCR, but um, I thought that I would then talk about a um, technology that's a little bit more recent and kind of um, new. So this is the this is the Carius technology that I think myself as well as some of the uh, ID fellows here were just uh, talking about. Um, so uh, the Carius test in particular and uh, refers to basically plasma metagenomic next-gen sequencing. Um, next-gen sequencing and uh, metagenomic next-gen sequencing doesn't have to only be done on plasma, but uh, within the ID world, um, certainly this plasma test is kind of the uh, up and coming, uh, big test that a lot of people are talking about. Um, the idea of uh, metagenomic next-gen sequencing is though that basically you have your sample type, which you could imagine could be plasma, could be anything, could be tissue. And, and there's certainly a few companies that are coming out with kind of uh, different commercial, uh, basically tests for these types of, um, for, for this type of sequencing. Um, but uh, basically you have your sample you have um, any you know, amount of nucleic acid in there. You have human DNA, you have microbial pathogen uh, nucleic acid potentially as well. And all the genomes basically, the first step is that it gets fragmented. Um, so the DNA or, or the nucleic acid is extracted and fragmented. Um, subsequently, these adapters, which are kind of short barcoding oligonucleotides are attached to your fragmented uh, nucleic acid fragments. And then um, similar to kind of Sanger sequencing, you have flow cells which have um, tiny amounts of oligonucleotides all kind of coding them. And those match the barcoded oligonucleotides that you just annealed to your fragmented nucle uh, nucleic acid. So therefore you can imagine you have these giant cells basically that then uh, have all these different types of fragmented nucleic acid attached to it. Um, uh, because of the fact that they've been barcoded and those barcodes then uh, match these kind of uh, oligonucleotides attached to the flow cell. Um, uh, Sanger sequencing then is basically what is 
going on for each kind of um, nucleic acid that you're actually sequencing. And each nucleotide that's added has a fluorophore attached to it that'll give a different visual output signal. Um, so you can imagine having thousands of cells and kind of flow lanes basically uh, that are all um, getting massively parallelly uh, sequenced at once. So what we call kind of high throughput sequencing. Um, so, you know, millions of these fragments are simultaneously and independently sequenced. And so you get these, uh, they're called contexts, but basically like longer reads of sequenced nucleic acid that are then have to be, go through basically complex computational algorithms to be matched and aligned, and then ultimately compared um, to a bioinformatic database for organism identification, um, which allows you to potentially identify many different organisms that could be potentially be in a uh, sample. Um, some of the challenges being, of course, first you have to remove all the human reads, for example, for um, uh, the carious test, for example, the, the plasma um, metagenomic next gen sequencing, because you're you're what you're for that test you're looking for um, infectious disease organisms, of course, or, or bacterial pathogens. Um, so you know, in terms of this test that's available, uh, the carious, it's you know, I should caveat that it's research use only. So it is performed at a CLIA certified laboratory, meaning that, you know, the laboratory meets government requirements, um, but it is not an FDA approved test, um, which means that also there are um, issues with when your uh, patients are trying to get reimbursed, you know, it's not necessarily covered by insurance because it's research use only. Um, so uh, certainly a consideration um, if you're going to be ordering a carious test. Um, but, you know, as you can see here, and I just kind of pulled up like uh, a generic report, uh, but this, you know, this report has no organisms identified, but, you know, the carious test talks about uh, the ability to basically bioinformatically identify, you know, 800 different types of bacteria, DNA viruses, archaea, fungi, eukaryotes. Um, the one caveat here being that, you know, RNA is not included in this list. So this is a DNA sequencing uh, test, basically, the carious that's available now. Um, they, in terms of the analytical performance of this test, um, you know, they compared it, uh, their, their clinical value evaluation was done in the SEPSEQ trial, which is a California based trial um, of 350 adult patients who came to an ED. And when they were admitted with sepsis like criteria, they got um, kind of a standard micro workup. So whatever blood or sputum or other cultures you might send for that patient. And then simultaneously got a carious test sent on them. And so then they compared basically uh, diagnostic utility, so talking about basically sensitivity and specificity um, uh, to those to that bold standard of the, the workup that was sent in the ED. Um, so you know they ended up calculating a sensitivity of 93% and a specificity of 63%. Um, you know uh, due to the kind of like growing popularity of this test, we at uh, at our hospital at Boston Children's we um, decided to undertake a utilization study to see um, how um, useful the carious test was and how accurate it was basically as a diagnostic test from our perspective. Um, that subseq trial was um, sponsored by the company, which you know doesn't mean that we shouldn't, uh, you know, tell it, we shouldn't just invalidate the results, but um, kind of just understanding that uh, kind of caveat. Um, so the objectives of this study was uh, this study was to number one assess the clinical impact. Um, talking mostly about were antibiotics changed because of the carious test, or was a novel diagnosis made, um, as well as the, assessing the diagnostic performance. So again, looking at that sensitivity and specificity question in comparison to standard uh, microbiological workup. Um, so we reviewed all the cases for two years. Um, uh, there weren't that many tests that were sent overall. Um, you know, in the end, we ended up having 59 tests in total that were sent. Um, so this is a smaller study, but again, like the, you know, Carious is an expensive test to send. And so it's not something that, uh, you know, a clinician should necessarily be sending off the bat. And it's also research use only, like, as I mentioned, so not necessarily covered by insurance either. Um, in terms of the kind of final diagnosis of what the patients you can, uh, you know, were diagnosed with, you can see here kind of um, the conditions in which people were considering sending a carious. Um, so, you know, oftentimes thing autoimmune disease, so kind of rare kind of panoply of symptoms, oftentimes type diagnosis where clinicians weren't sure what's going on. Um, interestingly, cases like bacteremia, um, certainly pneumonia, which is, you know, oftentimes empirically treated and might be severe and um, uh, providers wanted to kind of target an organism more um, or just kind of other uh, clinically unclear cases. 
um, as you can see here, 14% uh, of the time antibiotics were changed, 30% um, of the time uh, the organism wasn't relevant, and um, you know, half of the time basically it was a redundant organism. Um, I, the, the identification of a not relevant organism <clears throat> is I think an important point and caveat to think about with the curious test. Um, because you know what you're doing is whole genome sequencing of basically all of the, the nucleic acid within uh, a plasma sample. Um, so you can imagine, for example, there are transient bacteremic events that happen when you brush your teeth, as you know, is commonly cited. And other things, you know, even like potentially skin floor, we might experience transient bacteremia. Um, so the degree in which curious might pick up that um, is not well characterized yet. We don't really know. You know, we obviously haven't been whole genome sequencing people's plasma for a very long period of time. And so I think it's all the more reason why, um, you know, more kind of research and um, uh, has to be done into kind of how do we actually use the curious test and how does that test get interpreted? Because then does, you know, do people go on two weeks of vancomycin automatically for a coagulative staph that grows in a blood culture? Uh, you know, those are all kind of questions that you have to think about um, uh, with curious. Um, so, you know, ultimately of those uh, 59 uh, cases that were sent, um, five of them resulted in clinical impact. And, you know, I have the, the kind of short stories here um, that I, I'll briefly go through, but, you know, uh, one of the, I think, major uh, themes of this was that all of these patients uh, were basically immunocompromised. So a patient with a gamma globulinemia who had these recurrent skin infections and was interestingly found to have helicobacter, um, which we know is, you know, very difficult to culture. So kind of um, makes sense. A uh, patient with, you know, congenital immunodeficiency who actually had extra pulmonary legionellosis. So uh, quite unusual diagnoses. Um, fungal infections, which have always, you know, been kind of, um, you know, for those of us in ID, we, you know, we, we are aware that those things can be hard to diagnose and oftentimes are empirically treated. Um, and then interestingly, this, this last case here of uh, acanthamoeba diagnosis, which interestingly, a patient had disseminated acanthamoeba, um, ultimately had skin lesions in which the acanthamoeba was picked up, in fact, um, but the carious did get to the diagnosis a week earlier. Um, so, you know, uh, there are certainly scenarios where carriers can be useful and pick up things that you would never have thought of, like this patient who just had recurrent fevers and was diagnosed with extra pulmonary legionella or even the acanthamoeba, or such as the acanthamoeba case. Um, and then this is kind of just a, a summary slide. Um, you know, some of the benefits of ordering the carriers are that, um, you know, it's a commercial company. And so right now uh, they put a lot of emphasis in trying to get you rapid turnaround time results. So um, although the send out testing or the send out time is always gonna be kind of probably the rate limiting factor, um, the company does strive to basically do the whole, do the kind of uh, next gen sequencing within one day and get you usually the report, report within one to two days. Um, however, when you kind of think about that in terms of a send out test, which can potentially take three days to get to California, which is where the company is based out of, um, that probably is not different, so different than a blood culture, right? Four or five days in terms of turnaround time. Um, and then uh, you can see here that, you know, many times Carious is not, uh, you know, especially in the in how hospitals use it now, I think it's not something you send off the bat like a blood culture because it's a test that costs thousands of dollars. Um, it's sent in patients who are kind of clinical dilemmas. And so you can see that the majority of times uh, there wasn't a clinical impact and there was no change in antibiotics potentially uh, because, uh, you know, the carries is not actually providing that much additional information. Um, uh, another, uh, when we ultimately want to then uh, tackle that question of, you know, sensitivity and specificity, um, you know, one issue that we came into that I, I thought I'd just talk briefly about um, is, you know, this is how we kind of typically think about um, sensitivity and specificity for diagnostic tests, right? You have your true positives, and those are uh, divided basically by uh, kind of your uh, total like infection positive uh, patients, your specificity is those who um, have true or were true negatives divided by all the patients without infection. And then, uh, you know, you have your uh, positive predictive value and negative predictive value. When you have um, agnostic tests, uh, one thing that does happen is that uh, sometimes you have infections that are not related uh, to the test result that comes out, for example, of a curious result. Um, there are certainly scenarios that, you know, came up in my study as well as I've heard from other people using the curious that, for example, we had an endocarditis case in which um, there was E. coli identified in the culture 
culture, but ultimately the actual valve tissue that was expanded from the tissue from the patient, as well as an initial blood culture grew out strep. Um, and, and again, this is some of the issues with caries is that it's not well characterized and how it picks up organisms. You can imagine, as I was mentioning, that there are probably GI and skin type flora that you become transiently bacteremic with and could potentially be picked up by the caries. And so these results could be very misleading. Um, you know, I think that given the fact that, for example, in that endocarditis case, strep grew from the initial blood cultures as well from the valve itself, um, I think that that was a strep endocarditis case. I don't think that that E. coli um, was actually a true result. Uh, but when you have agnostic tests, um, realizing that there's this kind of special category of numbers to count um, makes a difference and also makes a difference in how you calculate your numbers. Um, and certainly that's what we found too. Um, as I mentioned, those um, sensitivity and specificity numbers from the uh, SEPSEQ trial, from what Curious uh, kind of sites was very high, right? Um, Right here, we're using the terms positive percent agreement and negative percent agreement instead of uh, sensitivity and specificity, basically, because when you don't know uh, what's the actual gold standard, it's actually more accurate to say agreement versus um, sensitivity and specificity. That usually refers to when you actually know what the gold standard diagnostic is. Um, so you can see that here, uh, you know, the sensitivity that was reported by the curious was something in the high mid 90s. Um, and then we had a positive percent agreement of 46%. Um, and then the other, uh, you know, kind of major thing to notice here is that, uh, you know, the true positives out of all of the curious positives, so these next gen sequencing positives is 55%, right? So only maybe half the time around, maybe a little bit more than that, um, was the curious test, um, you know, was the organism that was identified on the curious actually reflective of the infection that the providing clinicians thought was going on, uh, which again, I think is related again to this picking up of transient bacteremia and things like that, um, that can uh, be detected. Um, in something like uh, such a sensitive test as uh, whole genome sequencing. So um, all kind of food for thought. Um, so, you know, ultimately in our study, you know, we published those results, but, you know, um, I did just want to refer briefly to two other curious studies and there are more coming out. Um, but, you know, for example, this um, study by Hogan and colleagues that came out of Stanford noticed a, uh, noted a positive impact in 7% of patients, negative impact in 4%. So patients getting unnecessary antibiotics and procedures was how they categorized that. Um, and their ultimate conclusion that the, was that the real world impact of the curious um, is limited, um, is what they ended up writing. Um, similarly, there was another study that came out of uh, Baylor, Texas Children's, um, where they did a retrospective review as well of 60 patients. Um, they found 61% positive agreement, so very similar to some of our results. Uh, and then, you know, ultimately their conclusions uh, was that overall uh, next-gen sequencing added little diagnostic value when ordered concurrently with conventional testing, which is what CT stands for. Um, so, you know, these are just a, a handful of studies. Um, you know, I, I certainly see the scenarios where, um, you know, like such as the acanthamoeba case uh, where carries made a difference. Um, but, you know, as we use it, basically, uh, certainly the most of the time that you're sending the curious, you're not sending in obvious cases of when a patient comes in floridly septic with Staph aureus bacteremia. Um, so, you know, therefore, you know, kind of carefully thinking about the utility of the curious, I think is, um, an important thing to think about um, for those of us within ID world and as you know, clinicians and other specialties who might think about sending it. Um, so, you know, I think ultimately the takeaways that I gained from this project uh, were that, you know, certainly our kind of positive percent agreement and negative percent agreement, which is, you know, correlating to the sensitivity and specificity um, ideas uh, was significantly lower than what the original study uh, that was published in Nature Microbiology uh, you know, state cited. And that's partially the main motivation for that, I think, is that carious as it's used clinically right now um, is used as a tertiary level diagnostic. You're using it in scenarios when it's not uh, obvious what's going on. And so that makes, you know, the bar much more higher in terms of uh, kind of just like the sensitivity and specificity. Um, and then the, the other thing uh, to, to think about too, is that, as I mentioned, because, you know, this next gen sequencing technology can be so very sensitive and may be picking up transient bacteremia or even contaminants potentially as well. Um, you know, uh, the, the true positives out of the positive curious results was a little bit more than half, as I mentioned. Um, so ID consultation, potentially, if you're going to send the curious test, is probably worth it for interpretation of results. 
Um, lastly, as well, one trend that we noticed at Boston Children's was that people wanted to use the carious to rule out the presence of infection. Um, and we found that uh, the true negatives out of carious negatives was also around half percent, or sorry, half, uh, 50%. So, you know, more or less like flipping a coin. So, you know, for clinical scenarios where <clears throat> you're thinking, does this patient have an infection or is it autoimmune or something else going on? And you want to use the, <clears throat> excuse me, the carious to rule out infection. Uh, that's probably not the scenario in which you want to be using this test. Um, and so kind of another, uh, uh, you know, caveat to thinking about how we utilize this test, although of course it's early on and I think um, utilization patterns and how useful the test will be clinically still remain to be uh, determined. Uh, but that was my kind of spiel on next gen sequencing and our findings. Um, so uh, if there, I can, I can take a break. If, is there any particular questions or anything anybody had about that? Otherwise I thought I moved to kind of the next half of my um, uh, talk, which is more about kind of novel point of care technologies that I mean, play molecular based. No, uh, great. So, um, in terms of uh, kind of moving on, like I, you know, I clearly haven't explained PCR in this lecture because I think most of you are familiar with it. Um, but, you know, uh, other things that have come after PCR, you know, uh, or kind of the, the next generation of PCR-like tools, basically, um, there are a whole slew of kind of isothermal target amplification technologies, many of which are used in the micro lab right now. Um, I've listed a whole bunch of these, um, things like TMA, for example, um, tends to be the standard for gonorrhea chlamydia testing on something like a panther system or something, if, you, if you've heard of that. Um, uh, and a bunch of all of these different ones, which, which are all similar in nature to, to PCR itself. You can think of it as there's a polymerase enzyme and there's some sort of um, step basically where, you know, uh, the, uh, th there's like a, basically a, the same type of hybridization as well as uh, strand separation that goes on for each of these, but it doesn't necessarily require uh, the thermal temperatures to kind of trigger um, those amplification cycles. Um, this is incredibly useful, especially when we think about point of care technologies in terms of and my you know, personal interest is global health diagnostics. And so thinking about how we can make technology simpler and easier to use potentially for field deployable settings. Um, and then that uh, basically uh, kind of led me to the kind of my current research, which is our CRISPR-based diagnostics. Um, so, you know, I won't go through all the isothermal target <laughs> amplification technologies, clearly there's too many of them, but just to be aware that these are some of the, the things that are being thrown out. And these are in essence, basically similar to PCR, it's just maybe potentially doesn't require, doesn't require the thermal cycling you can think about and uses kind of specially optimized enzymes. Um, so, uh, talking about kind of the main research project that I did um, during my fellowship and then kind of is ongoing. Um, so I worked on CRISPR-based diagnostics for malaria. Um, so, you know, I, I probably don't need to emphasize malaria is obviously, um, you know, a, a disease of major global health importance, uh, nearly 230 million cases, 409,000 deaths a year. Um, you know, ultimately for the goal of malaria eradication, which is a kind of WH goal within the, the uh, Global Malaria Control Program, we will need a kind of point of care, more sensitive and more um, species specific diagnostics. Um, so uh, to go over uh, briefly kind of some of the diagnostic gaps that live, that you know, exists within uh, the malaria world. Uh, basically today, it's kind of um, almost surprising, but you know, similar to how, you know, many of the, the microbiotic techniques developed in the late 1800s still remember, remain the standard of care, but uh, light microscopy as well as antigen-based lateral flow rapid diagnostic tests uh, still are the primary uh, diagnostic tools used in the field. Um, so, and, and when I say lateral flow tests, I, I'm referring to basically uh, kind of immunochromatographic tests. So um, things where there's an antigen an antibody basically, and it you know has some sort of gold nanoparticle attached to it, which is detected down the lateral flow strip. So a protein-based test. Um, and then light microscopy, of course, refers to a peripheral blood smear. So, you know, thick and thin smears for malaria, if you remember that from medical school, or if you've seen that actually in, in your clinical practice. Um, 
So uh, however, even though these types of tests remain the gold standard, um, basically the limitation is that uh, low density infections, so particularly things less than 200 parasites per microliter, um, fall below the limit of detection. And submicroscopic carriers um, are estimated to be responsible to 20 to 50% of all ongoing malaria transmission. So to truly eradicate malaria, you're going to have to be able to detect the asymptomatic carriers and uh, treat them. Um, and so that is one major issue. Um, the other one is uh, that many existing uh, rapid diagnostic tests, so you know these antigen-based lateral flow tests, are incapable of species-specific identification. Um, usually, uh, they are using the histidine-rich protein two antigen, or uh, there's an aldolase pan-malaria antigen as well as the LDH pan-malaria antigen, um, and uh, those, you know, that's basically the, the state of most um, RDTs right now. They are either detector and falciparum or they detect basically the presence of a pan-malaria antigen in the absence of a falciparum um, antigen. And then that says that it must be a non-falciparum malaria species. Um, so it's still pretty nonspecific and um, this matters um, because uh, as many of you probably know, uh, plasmodium vivax and an ovale in particular can go into a hypnozoite uh, stage of malaria where you know uh, the parasite travels to the liver and remains dormant. And so you can get relapse in malaria, you know, even you know, months to years after the initial infection. Um, and if you don't treat it appropriately, um, it requires, uh, you know, premoquin or tofenoquin, uh, basically an eight amino fluoroquinolone therapy. Um, if you don't treat it with that special type of therapy, then you can easily get, then potentially you might get relapse. Um, and so, you know, species specific identification still remains a very big gap in terms of malaria diagnostics. Um, lastly, unfortunately uh, for, um, uh, the, the field of diagnostics for malaria as well. Um, there's actually evolving uh, mutations where the HRP2 gene, that gene that I mentioned, which is, uh, or that antigen that I mentioned, which is the main falciparum antigen detected on most rapid diagnostic tests, um, it's increasingly um, absent basically in uh, plasmodium falciparum parasites. You can find parts of South America and the Amazon where up to half of the uh, malarial like parasites don't even have uh, that antigen, which is a, a really interesting example, I think, of um, pathogens evolving against the diagnostic. But uh, again, maybe potentially an example of kind of evolutionary pressure uh, and how these RDTs have been so frequently used and now potentially uh, becoming obsolete. Um, so a nucleic acid-based test basically that could target a specific gene um, would overcome these uh, basically limitations. And so, you know, what ultimately I worked on in the lab is coming up with a kind of simplified workflow that would be easier um, than something like, uh, a, you know, thick and thin blood smears that, you know, have a, take a technician that's highly trained as well as all the, the prep that has to go into the thick and thin blood smears. Um, and so, you know, in terms of this kind of simplified workflow, uh, basically, you know, we were able to demonstrate that on serum, whole blood, or a dried blood spot, we had a simplified sample preparation process for extraction of nucleic acids. Um, uh, so basically, there was a lysis buffer and heating step for 10 minutes. And then a, the supernatant of this uh, reaction basically is then added into a uh, one-step uh, Sherlock reaction, which I'll explain in a minute here, uh, that then goes for 60 minutes and then can be read either by a lateral flow strip um, or uh, hand, or like, for example, a handheld fluorometer, or you could imagine kind of a mass surveillance um, uh, scenario where lots of different patient samples are all on a plate and read in a plate reader. And we can get to very low detection, uh, basically for the plasmodium falciparum parasite down to 0.3 copies per microliter using this workflow. Um, Sherlock itself though, um, if for those of you who are not uh, familiar with it, how it works, um, it's a technology that's kind of um, up and coming. And, you know, part of the reason why I joined the lab was that I was interested in this uh, type of CRISPR-based technology. Um, and so, uh, you know, how it works basically is uh, Sherlock has this very long uh, name, which is uh, basically a uh, specific high sensitivity enzymatic reporter unlocking. Um, so that abbreviation is uh, Sherlock and refers to this basically combination of steps I'm gonna go through here. Um, so the first step is an amplification step using an isothermal amplification technology like the types that I was mentioning before. So it uses uh, recombinase polymerase amplification, which uh, proceeds at 37 degrees. And this allows us basically to get to extremely low limits of detection by having this amplification step um, before basically a cast detection step. Um, so uh, your nucleic acid step is 
amplify first, basically. Um, and then the second step is uh, the CRISPR-Cas enzyme uh, part, basically, which allows for the identification and the signal um, to be read. Uh, so Cas enzymes, I'm not sure if uh, many of you are familiar, but you know, probably many of you have heard of CRISPR. CRISPR genome editing. So, you know, bacteria basically have these adaptive immune systems uh, that they've developed where they have these enzymes uh, that basically uh, very specifically identify um, short segments of nucleic acids. You know, it was designed mostly as a kind of a host events potentially for viruses. And uh, you basically, each of these Cas enzymes get loaded with something called the guide RNA, which um, can match a pathogen target basically. So around a 20 nucleotide sequence. Um, when uh, the CRISPR-Cas enzyme identifies its target sequence because of, you know, the hybridization and the matching basically of this sequence, um, uh, then basically the CRISPR-Cas enzyme is activated and then it cleaves that target sequence. Um, and this is the basis for genome editing basically is that that's, that's, you know, how it works is that, you know, you can target very specific gene sequences because you can load your CRISPR-Cas enzyme with any guide RNA that you want. Um, so for example, for this malaria work, you know, we, uh, designed a guide RNA that would very uh, specifically and sensitively um, identify the plasmodium uh, uh, target, basically. Uh, however, there are certain special enzymes. So um, Cas9 is the usual one used for gene editing, but Cas12 and Cas13 have a very unique characteristic in that uh, when they identify their target, they also start to have a collateral cleavage effect is what we call it. Um, so it'll start to non-specifically cleave nucleic acid in the area. And you can imagine that for the purposes of like a bacterial defense mechanism, maybe that evolved because you know it's starting to try to start apoptosis or something to kind of cleave all the invading uh, viral, uh, you know, uh, nucleic acid that's coming into play. Um, however, you know, for our purposes, what we do is we spike in a probe. So basically a single stranded DNA segment that has a floor floor and quencher on it. And so when um, uh, basically the plasmodium target is activated or that the CRISPR-Cas enzyme is activated upon identification of its target, it will cleave the probe and release this floor floor, which can be detected. Um, so this is the overall process of Sherlock. Um, the, you know, why is this better than uh, uh, just like having RPA alone and amplification technology? Um, it's mostly because of the fact that, uh, you know, this uh, guide RNA part allows for highly specific identification. Um, that 20 nucleotide match basically to plasmodium is what eventually allowed us to create a diagnostic that was able to sensitively and specifically, um, you know, identify or uh, basically characterize the four different uh, major pathogenic species of plasmodium. So, uh, you know, falciparum, vivax, ovale, and malariae. And so uh, not only are we able to achieve super low limits of detection because we have this amplification step followed by the kind of CAS um, step, which amplifies the signal as well, um, but also we are able to achieve very sensitive or, or specific detection as well. Um, so, you know, as I was mentioning, uh, so we published a paper in PNAS uh, last year, and uh, we achieved very low limits of detection here for falciparum, vivax, ovale, and malaria. You can see very highly specific detection as well. There wasn't cross-reactivity um, at one femtomolar concentrations, basically, so pretty high uh, concentrations of uh, these stimulated sample here. And then uh, we also adapted this to a lateral flow output as well, in addition um, to uh, the two-way fluorescent output, um, which again is, is um, I won't go into the details of that, but is, is based again upon the detection of that floor for that, that is released basically with cleavage of the probe. Um, and then uh, for the last part, I thought I would just go uh, briefly into kind of the, the next uh, project that kind of evolved out of that malaria one um, is, uh, you know, recently published uh, my Sherlock device, which is a, a self-contained CRISPR-based diagnostic um, for SARS-CoV-2 and variant detection. Um, and so, you know, uh, from, we had kind of a Broke, broken out kind of workflow that was still like a lab bench protocol initially, um, especially with the, you know, the pressure of the pandemic, um, many of us transitioned to working on COVID related diagnostics. And, you know, here the theme was could we create a completely self-contained device, putting all those steps that you saw for the malaria workflow into an integrated device. And um, we were able to achieve that. And, you know, the, the two kind of settings that we envisioned it being used for were again, global health and resource limited settings. Um, you know, this device just requires a battery pack um, and, you know, is supposed to be user friendly. So not requiring a technician with complicated pipetting, centrifuging steps, things like that. Um, and then in addition, um, 
uh, you know, potentially for at home user settings as well, um, because this device was designed to be very simple and possibly uh, usable by lay users. And so how uh, this device works is basically that the, the patient um, spits saliva into a sample prep chamber, um, which filters down into this waste filter and nucleic acid is captured onto a paper filter at the bottom of the sample prep chamber. Um, there is heating also involved with this, as well as a lysis buffer that is pre-prepped in the sample prep chamber. Um, and and, uh, you know, uses a lot of the same kind of uh, sample prep things that we developed for the malaria work, in fact. Um, subsequently, basically, the sample prep chamber with the uh, small membrane that has your captured nucleic acid on it gets transferred into a, the incubator side, basically, of the device. Uh, and a plunger with uh, is basically a cover with plunger is used to basically puncture um, the bottom of the sample prep chamber, push the uh, paper membrane through into an Eppendorf tube that has a one pot or basically one step Sherlock reaction in it, um, as well as a rehydration buffer, which is in uh, this incubation chamber as well here, it's just in the top. So as you push through, it not only pushes your paper through, but also um, this uh, rehydration buffer that's sitting right here in the top of the chamber. Um, subsequently, basically this um, rehydrated one pot Sherlock reaction goes for 60 minutes and uh, a visual output can be seen at the end, which we matched with a, um, uh, basically smartphone app as well. Um, we went after four uh, different targets. So we have a universal SARS-CoV-2 assay for our universal detection. And then uh, three mutations, basically it's the alpha, beta and gamma variant mutations um, for the UK and Brazilian variants. At the time, Delta wasn't even uh, there. And so we didn't design an assay for that uh, when we try to publish, although uh, something that our lab continues to work on. Um, so ultimately this is kind of what the device looks like. Um, you know, it's this small portable handheld device that's battery powered. And, uh, you know, in this version of the device, um, you can see that there are two kind of uh, Sherlock acids. You can imagine that this could be a universal SARS-CoV-2 assay and this could be UK variant or something like that. But we wanted this uh, device to be kind of modular and that these uh, little Eppendorf tubes are, you can kind of think of them as like cured cups that can be popped in and out. So you can put in kind of the, the variant of your concern or, you know, these, uh, this diagnostic can be adapted to local and regional interest as needed. Um, ultimately, you know, we were able to demonstrate that our assay had uh, a good limit of detection. So on par with the CDC nasopharyngeal swab assay. So something along the level of a thousand copies per milliliter. Um, and this is our universal SARS-CoV-2 assay. And then uh, we were as well able to demonstrate basically high specificity again for these variant mutations, which is really leveraging again, that CRISPR-Cas enzyme, high specificity cap capability. It'd be very hard to basically design uh, PCR primers to distinguish potentially a one, you know, uh, single base pair change, which is, you know, some of these mutations, for example, the E, uh, for example, the N501Y is a, a single base pair change. It'd be hard to design a PCR assay that'd be able to um, be able to differentiate that. But using the Sherlock technology and this highly specific uh, guide RNA, uh, we were able to achieve um, basically high specificity as you can see here with all these mutations versus uh, wild type. Um, and then, you know, also we built multiplex basically devices that potentially could put, you know, three to four assays. And as I mentioned, you can imagine each of these Eppendorf's like uh, little kind of cure cups where you can, you can select or put in the, the variant or the assay of your choice. Um, so I think, um, you know, ultimately in terms of uh, the next steps of our, of our lab, we're thinking of, uh, you know, how we can create more uh, larger kind of suite of multiplex diagnostics for global health purposes. Um, and, you know, who knows, maybe um, COVID purposes, unfortunately, as well in the future, um, depending on what happens in this pandemic. Um, I think um, that's all I had to cover today. Um, I did want to acknowledge, of course, everybody at the lab and um, all the funding organizations that have supported um, this research and uh, my primary co monitors of uh, James Collins and uh, Nira Pollock as well. Um, if, did anybody have any questions or um, comments about anything I presented? This is, this is Dave. Uh, I, that was fantastic. That was great talk. Very interesting work. Um, uh, and I'm glad, I, you know, I actually in the middle of your, your malaria diagnostic talk, I remembered, I remember where I'd seen your face before. It was, you're a, welcome, you're a Burroughs welcome fellow, which I hope I'm not embarrassing you with that. And I think that's a tremendous honor. Uh, you didn't, you didn't, you didn't actually, you know, include that in your blurb. <laughs> 
Um, <laughs> nice. um, uh, back to the metagenomics, um, mm-hmm. uh, you know, carious is a blood test. And I know you talked about like specific, maybe clinical syndromes or situations where it might be more, uh, have a better utility. Um, what about other, you know, fluid sites or anything like that? Do you envision any like metagenomic testing that might be, you know, useful like for lungs, like a CF lung even, you know, to track as opposed, you know, right now they do CF cultures and, you know, they have to pick through all the pathogens and stuff like that. But um, yeah. Yeah, no, I think it's certainly a good question. And I think that it, it is probably like, I think on the, uh, you know, way to being developed, if not already there, I think that I know that there's like, there is metagenomic next gen sequencing, I think for BAL um, samples, but certainly tissue, I think is on the probably horizon um, and potentially um, might be uh more useful, I, I would imagine, just because at least for maybe protected sites of tissue, you would imagine that it shouldn't be as exposed to things like transient bacteremia. Um, so maybe would be, you know, more analogous to a truly sterile site um, where the kind of ultra sensitivity of next gen sequencing wouldn't potentially give you um, a false positive diagnosis. Um, and, you know, uh, certainly I think for immunocompromised uh, patients in general, um, you know, CF, you know, kind of being some variant of that, it, it potentially could, um, certainly have more utility. Um, it's, you know, it's for things that you kind of don't expect or don't see coming. Um, and certainly for fungal diagnostics too, like even if the fungus grows, it can take, you know, four or six weeks to grow. So sometimes knowing that answer of if it's truly aspergillus, faster um, can, can be helpful to patients. Um, but I think there will always be this kind of uh, very difficult balance between knowing if it's colonization, uh, transient bacteremia, or actually true pathogen. Yep. <laughs> Well, uh, yeah, and if there, if there are no other questions too, I don't wanna, I know uh, there's a, always a lot of work to do at UH and Rainbow, so no worries if people wanna get back to, to their uh, rounds and things. Thank you so much, Dr. Lee. I really learned a ton. I'm really excited about the Sherlock technology um, in the global health community. Um, very interesting research with malaria um, specifically. So thank you very much for sharing. I, I definitely learned a lot. Um, and I think everyone on this call definitely did. So we really appreciate you coming virtually to join us. Great, yeah, no, thanks so much for having me.